Miguel Adorati back here on the CRP, and I'm joined by our MMA ace, Devin Miller, and we are going to talk the recent signing by Bellator of former UFC heavyweight champion Josh Barnett. Barnett, not been seen in action since 2016 when he left the UFC after beating Andre Arlovsky. Uh, he's been dabbling in pro wrestling, and I think we're getting Josh Barnett just about on the plus side of 40. Uh, as he returns to MMA, Bellator already has uh, a little bit of a geriatric league going on, and Barnett is uh, assigning right up that alley. Devin, what you, was your impression when you heard Josh Barnett's name come across the board again? Well, it kind of just reinforced my view that Bellator continues to gobble up older talent. They've been doing this for a, lo- a lot of years now. Um, a lot of former UFC contenders they bring in later in life, as you said, that you always call it the geriatric league. And but it, this is an interesting addition because it has such an interesting storyline. I mean, obviously Barnett dates back into the early 2000s inside of the UFC. Five he fought he fought in Japan. Um, he uh, he fought for M1 Global. He fought. Uh, so back when the, when Affliction was doing, uh, stuff, he fought Pedro Hizzo, uh, he was a former UFC champion, beat Randy Couture. But the, the interesting story behind Josh Barnett right now is Josh Barnett, uh, his inactivity over the past several years has been due to USADA. He got popped for a USADA violation that actually turned out, uh, to be due to a contaminated substance, and this was proven. And he has been a very vocal critic of USADA ever since. And he's probably been one of the most, if not the most notable case of a situation where USADA just got it wrong. And obviously we got the John Jones uh, erection pill scandal, too, where that's the whole storyline behind that is that that was due to that he felt that drug test due to a contaminated erection um, male enhancement supplement, which nobody really bought. Barnett doesn't have really a long history of failing drug tests. Oh, yeah, he does. And, but he, oh, oh yeah, he does. Oh, yeah, he does. He's, he's, failed, he's failed. He was probably, he probably leads the UFC in number of drug tests failed because this would probably put him at about three or four. He failed them in the early days. He's always disputed them and said that they were wrong. And, you know, because then you get into a litigation process, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of get to pick who you believe kind of thing, but no one really knows for sure. I mean, I'm, you're not in the lab doing the exam, so at the end of the day, you kind of got to believe what's going on. But Josh has always been an adamant uh, person that he has been pop pop for, uh, you know, non-use you know use reasons. So, but uh, this is not the first time. In fact, he was UFC champion. If I'm not mistaken, his first UFC reign came to an end. Because around failed drug tests. I don't know if he lost the fight, and then the drug test also came back high. I don't remember because it was a long time ago. But Josh Barnett was probably the first UFC fighter, the first MMA fighter of a high profile to blow hot and go through the process with Matt Hume as his manager at the time of denying and saying that we didn't, you know, that it's not correct and that the tests were were wrong and minuscule. You know, that, that they were they were part of. The first people to take people through the the, the uh, litigation process. The fact is, is all, a lot of that stuff happened pre Zufa. So you know, I don't even remember was the drug test with Zufa or or how all that worked out. But uh, you know, Josh was able to come back and he was able to compete. But he always denied the use. This would probably be the third or fourth time in his career that that's popped up. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I didn't even really know that information, so I I stand corrected, but. Josh Barnett as a competitor, I mean, he's been in there for, like I said, many years, as you just alluded to. And, you know, he's got notable wins over guys like Frank Mayer and Randy Couture and Pedro Hizzo back in the day. He, uh, his first, he fought and tried. His first uh, UFC uh, competition was, I just say, UFC 28 back in uh, November of the year 2000 against Dan McGee in a fight that he won. Then he lost the fight to Pedro and went on quite a tear 
leading up to his Wanafin uh, Pride, to his couple of Wanafin and Pride, the Miracle Krokop. That I, was, I, could say, I, I knew him very well. I was at that Pedro Rizzo fight, and I could tell you that they were very mad, him and Matt Hume, because they they took it to him. They came at Rizzo and won, because Rizzo was basically a staller and a very hard guy to beat, you, you know, and you got to play his game. So they threw the kitchen sink at him, and he got caught, if I remember correctly. But I, what I do remember that, that with absolute certainty is them both telling me, that game plan, if we ever fight him again, we will stand in front of him for four minutes and 40 seconds and do absolutely nothing and then run him over for 20 seconds and win the round. They were going to game plan it because they didn't like the way the judges looked at that fight or, or the way he got caught and then wound up losing, and then all of a sudden, you know, the other guy gets to win the higher end of the paycheck and stuff. Was it all worth it? But that was a philosophical discussion they had around that fight, because Rizzo, you know, Rizzo did that to Mark Coleman, to a very controversial win over Coleman, where it was a split decision, and basically a couple of leg kicks slowed Coleman down, but Coleman did a lot of the work. I feel Coleman won that fight. Um, but yeah, so so when I'm speaking of, of Barnett with that, you can take it for sure that his name has come up with steroids before. The resolutions there, I'm not saying he's an user or anything like that. I don't, I don't you know, and I know him, so I don't want him to think I'm, I'm, in, I'm bad-mouthing him, but his name has come up several times with, with steroids in the past, so, so that you're aware. Okay, and I think probably the most notable thing on his record, besides obviously the UFC title that he had won back in, uh, back in the early 2000s, was that he was one of the few guys that beat uh, Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira in pride. Uh, Nob came back and avenged that loss, but he actually had a split decision win in pride in 2006 against uh, Nogueira. And he also has notable wins over Mark, uh, Mark Hunt and Jeff Bonson. As, we mentioned, as he, he just thought he came back and beat his, uh, he fought Daniel Cormier in the Strike Force uh, Grand Prix main event. And Cormier, that was when Cormier was really rising to prominence. Got a big win over Sergey Karatonov and Roy Nelson. So he's been around the block. He's really, and then obviously Andre Olofsky in his last fight. So he's been in there with really the best of the best heavyweights of the past couple of decades. Pretty much everybody but Fedor. Probably the biggest blot on his record is he's got three three um, losses to Mirko Krokop, which hurt his, hurt his resume a lot, but Crow um, uh, Cup was, was his key to, you know, he beats Crow Cup, we get Fedor Barnett then, and not the classic Crow Cup Fedor fights that we got. It, he was on the cusp of that fight, the Fedor fight, with Fedor is the number one guy. Barnett is a real guy. I mean, in 2006, uh, you know, Crow Cup maybe had his number, but if you put him in with Fedor, um, you're looking at a, a pretty much a 50-50 fight. A bigger guy, smarter, a smart guy, um, a guy who's going to come in with a serious game plan, and a guy with a mixed bag of tricks who's going to know what you do, as opposed to Crow Cop, who was more of a striker, you know? So, very interesting situation, and Barnett was right on the door of being a real dominant guy, but then, you know, those fights didn't work out, and negotiations didn't work out in other places, he stayed inactive, um, and then... I don't know, I'd call his later comeback kind of half-hearted, you know. Uh, how do you go on a two-fight winning streak in the UFC and then not fight for three years, you know? I mean, maybe you wanted out of the UFC contract, you wanted to get over to Bellator, and you had to wait some time and stuff like that. But a lot of what uh, unfortunately has happened to Josh, Josh is that the inactivity and his dabbling, not even dabbling, it's his second career in pro wrestling, um... He's always given him, you know, something else and stuff like that, and it seems like he's never been fully dedicated. I think Bellator will be right up his alley. I think if we get Fedor and Barnett now, um, you know, they're both 43. I, it, it, <laughs> I, the fight has a pers- perspective of being better than Chuck versus Tito, put it that way. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a lot of what we're going to see. Is, um, I, think, I think that's a very top possibility that we see Barnett and Fedor, um, I, and I do remember that as this was an early fan back in like 2006, 2007, um, just really getting to know the Pirates in UFC and in Pride, I remember thinking that Barnett would, might be stylistically the biggest threat to Fedor at the time, and 
you know, never came to fruition, but Barnett has, has had a pretty solid career. I, uh, I was actually, I gotta admit, I was actually unaware that he had a, uh, long history with steroid, uh, with steroid violations. But, uh, I know that's been what's been really kind of holding him up over the past several years. And I think the move to Bellator is at a good time for him. I think the heavyweight division in the UFC has moved past him at this point. But even at heavyweight, we've seen time and time again that it's the one division that people can tend to, tend to fight up into their later ages and still be successful and compared to those smaller weight classes. So I think he still has some left, and maybe the hiatus and the, the time off will be good for him and the change of scene will be good for him. And uh, we'll see how it goes in the future. Have you seen him coming back? Do you see him coming back as a one-off just to fight Fedor for Bellator? Uh, or is it a situation where, you know, we might see him on a 2-3 fight run over the next year? I'm not sure. I mean, it, I think a lot of it's going to be off of that first fight that he has. We'll see what he has left. He already fought Frank Mir. Uh, Frank Mir's over in Bellator right now. He knocked Frank Mir out. That could be potentially ran back. Um, they might even throw him in there with somebody like Matt Mitrione, which I think would be an interesting fight. Um, I think the Fedor fight is probably the the fight that I would lean toward is what's likely. But uh, I, I don't know. I think if he I think if he wins, he'll fight again. Let's just say that. Uh, but I, I don't think that he's going to win and go out. But um, I think he'll probably fight until he loses. Okay. And uh, we are talking here at the CRP about the return of Josh Barnett. A uh, long time ago, one-time UFC heavyweight champion, now back with Bellator, signing on to the Bellator roster. Uh, no official first opponent announced, but we're talking about the return of Josh Barnett on the CRP.